students. This is Dr. Tim Brooker again. In our previous discussions together, we talked about uh, the competing paradigms of popular culture in America. That's a pretty esoteric discussion. Uh, has to do more with philosophy than anything particularly practical. In this video, we would like to take the competing paradigms into the practical realm. Uh, we'll, we'll begin by talking about politics and the fact that in the political realm, you can see the existence of the, the competing paradigms as clearly as we could philosophically in the, in the previous video. So again, buckle up and we'll, we'll dive into the political realm first and then, as the title of this course indicates, we're going to talk extensively about economics as well. Because you need to understand that there are competing economic paradigms, there are competing political paradigms, and yes, there are even competing public policy paradigms that are as evident as, as, uh, as anything. So let's, let's explore those a little bit. As we talk about the political realm, let's go back in American history. Our Declaration of Independence was signed in July of 1776. And these words began it. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, including the right to life, to liberty, and to pursue their own happiness. As you can see, this is incredibly theistic. Now there's some debate about exactly what stripe of, of uh, theistic people they were. Were they deists? Were they Christians? Um, basically, a deist is just someone who believes in God the Creator, God the Father, but is just not really sure exactly who Jesus was. So either way, you have men who believed in God who founded this country. So our, the paradigm that created the United States of America was implicitly theistic. In addition to the basic wording of the Declaration of Independence, which we all are familiar with, there are other historical uh, components that you probably are not familiar with. Perhaps you're not aware of how that Declaration of Independence came to be signed, because you probably never heard it, because it doesn't fit the secular narrative. But Ronald Reagan said it best, in a speech that he, uh, that he made to his alma mater, uh, Dixon College, back in the 50s. And he retells the writings of Thomas Jefferson. Let me just quote a little bit from this speech because it tells a story of something you probably have never heard. Again, this is Ronald Reagan. Almost two centuries ago, it group of disturbed men met in the small Pennsylvania State House as they gathered to decide on a course of action. Behind the locked and guarded doors, they debated for hours whether or not to sign the declaration which had been presented for their consideration. For hours, the talk was treason and its price, the headsman's axe, the gallows, and noose, the talk went on and decision was not forthcoming. <clears throat> then Jefferson wrote, a voice was heard coming from the balcony. They may stretch our necks on all the gibbets in the land. They may turn every tree into a gallows, every home into a grave, and yet the words of that parchment can never die. They may pour our blood on a thousand scaffolds, and yet from every drop that dies the axe, a new champion of treason will spring into birth. 
the words of this declaration will live long after our bones are dust. To the mechanic in his workshop, they will speak hope. To the slave in the mines, freedom. But to the coward rulers, these words will speak in tones of warning they cannot help but hear. Sign that parchment. Sign if the next moment the noose is around your neck. Sign if the next minute this hall rings with the clash of falling axes. Sign by all your hopes in life or death, not only for yourselves, but for all ages. For that parchment will be the textbook of freedom, the Bible of the rights of man forever. Were my soul trembling on the verge of eternity, my hand freezing in death, I would still implore you, remember this truth. God has given America to be free. As he finished, the speaker sank back in his seat exhausted. <clears throat> Inspired by his eloquence, the delegates rushed forward to sign the Declaration of Independence. When they turned to thank the speaker for his timely words, he could not be found, and to this day no one knows who he was or how he entered or left the locked and guarded room. Bet you never heard that story before. But if you go to the old Pennsylvania State House to this day and take the tour, they will tell that story about how the delegates to the convention had pretty much talked themselves out of signing. I mean, when, when you debate for hours and all you're talking about is you realize they're going to kill us if we uh, sign this. You realize they're going to cut our heads off or they're going to hang us. Well, remember the preparations that they had taken. <clears throat> they had a guard at every door. And they had a guard outside every window. To make sure that no inappropriate ears happened to hear the discussions that were taking place. Because they were committing treason against the most powerful person on the planet, King George. So, they took extra precautions to make sure that their deliberations remained confidential. And then that eloquent speech that I just read came from a man sitting in the balcony that nobody knew. They don't know how he got in. They don't know how he got out. But he changed the course of history. You can say, oh, well, you know, that's just legend. But that event changed history. They believed that this nation the, the Declaration of Independence was signed because of divine intervention. So the very founding of this nation was from a very unashamedly theistic event. Those men believed it happened. Let's talk a little bit briefly about later on. <clears throat> After the Revolutionary War, we were forced as a nation to set up a government. And frankly, they didn't know what to do. They didn't really know what kind of a government to establish. So they went with the least harmful system they could come up with, a confederation of the states. And the confederation of the states was basically creating a federal government that was too weak to do them any harm. It really couldn't do anything. It was more like a club of friendship among the states. Each of the states had their own foreign policies. They had their own coins. They had their own monetary systems. They had their own trade policies. They had their own judicial systems. They, we were like 13 little countries sitting here on this continent. And obviously... 
that's a recipe for disaster. Uh, there was an incident where both Florida and Georgia, no, actually it was Georgia, wanted some uh, assistance from the other colonies to fend off some roving bands of, of Indians coming up out of Florida. And so they submitted to the the federal government, such as it was, to mandate that the other colonies come and help them. Well, under the Articles of Confederation, it took nine of 13 votes to pass anything. And they simply said, well, I don't think we want to come and help you. And they didn't. So the article, the federal government was so weak under the Articles of Confederation, they basically couldn't do anything. So they knew after 10 years of experience with this system, they had to do something different. So the question became, how do we set up a better government? What are we going to do? Now, under the Articles of Confederation, any changes to the Articles had to be unanimous. All 13 states, if you will, had to agree to any changes. Well, that was never going to happen. You can't get 13 people to agree on anything. So they essentially violated the Articles of Confederation by holding a constitutional convention under the guise of amending the Articles of Confederation. So what did they decide to do? I've recorded the uh, America to be free uh, speech here for your for your uh, records if nothing else because if you're like me the words are so powerful and you might want to share it with friends and family so here's the entire text of that speech by Ronald Reagan quoting Thomas Jefferson's story uh, so you'll have this for your consideration so the Articles of Confederation failed. The American, the original American Confederacy failed because you cannot have 13 individual little countries sitting on the same continent with each doing their own thing. There was no unity. So the, the Founding Fathers looked for a better system. They didn't know where to find it. So they undertook a massive letter writing campaign with each other. So the founding fathers exchanged letters proposing, what do we do next? Well, a few years ago, the University of Houston collected about 2,500 of those letters where they were uh, discussing what needed to be done next. Because they were open to anything. So we looked to see, well, now, what did they quote? And that was the content analysis of the, the Houston study. Who was it that the founding fathers were quoting to each other? It was very relevant. What kind of influences shaped the new constitution? So they did a content analysis of these 2,500 letters to see who it was that the Founding Fathers were quoting to each other. So here's what the uh, University of Houston study found. There were four major authors, if you will, four major sources that were quoted in the writings of the Founding Fathers in the letters that they sent back and forth to each other. One was Blackstone's commentary on the common law. <clears throat> this English book described basically what the, the, the sum total of all of the experience and judicial opinions, that's what the common law is, it's the sum total of judicial opinions to date had been. So that was Blackstone's commentary on the law. <clears throat> the next influence 
were the writings of John Locke, again, a British philosopher. He was most famous for his discussions of natural law and the rights of humanity that are, that are given by God to the individual. Jefferson actually quoted John Locke for the most part when he talked about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In, in Locke's writings, it was life, liberty, and the right to own property, which is an extremely important aspect in the uh, economic system that, was, that we'll talk about later. But the writings of John Locke were sort of the third most interesting or, or most quoted uh, writings. The second was the writings of Montesquieu. Montesquieu was a French philosopher who also was very influential in that day. But by far, the most quoted source of information was scripture, the Bible. The founding fathers, you know, like three times more than Locke, four times more than Montesquieu, and ten times more than Blackstone, they talked about the Bible. And they particularly were interested in one portion of Scripture. Now, were you aware that in Scripture God instructed Moses on how to set up a perfect government? When Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage, and they were entering the promised land, God instructed Moses how to set up a government. And what he instructed him to set up was a republic. This is known as the Hebrew Republic. And what was not readily known is that uh, this was more influential in our own constitution than any other source of the day. The best exposition on the use of, of the Hebrew Republic as a model for the U.S. Constitution was in an 1853 book called Commentaries on the Laws of the American Hebrews. I'm sorry, Commentaries on the Laws of the Ancient Hebrews by Reverend E.C. Wines. And in this book, it's massive, it's hundreds and hundreds of pages. But in this book, Wines outlines 22 separate principles that were lifted, if you will, from the Hebrew Republic and directly inserted into the new U.S. Constitution. Now stop and think about this. If you are a Christian or a at least someone who believes in, in God the Father and God the Creator, and you find out that there is a divinely inspired inerrant system of government in scripture, would that not get your attention? Would you not be intrigued by the notion that, hey, there's a system of government here in the divinely inspired inerrant scripture? So they pulled 22 different components out of that and put them directly into the U.S. Constitution. Things like uh, a separate executive branch, a, a constitution, because that by definition is what makes a republic. A republic has to have a constitution. And God mandated a constitution for the Hebrew Republic. And separate executive and judicial branches and legislative branches composed of two houses. All of those things that we have always been taught were directly from the Greeks and the Romans, they didn't have two houses in their legislature. They didn't have one. One of the things that the Hebrew Republic had was a single class of citizens. There's no royalty. There were no elites. There was only 
one man, one vote. Now, yeah, sure, we were dealing with the issue of slavery and, and that we need to, to uh, address separately. Because the, the Founding Fathers knew that slavery was an ab abomination. And if you read the writings at the time, they simply said, look, we got to deal with this. But we're not going to be around as a nation if we don't come together and become a single nation. So they said, we'll, we'll postpone the slavery decision for like 20 years. But meantime, we got to get a government established that is functional that brings us into the United States of America instead of the divided 13 colonies on this, on this continent. So the needs to create a, a single nation were given precedence over that other pressing issue, which obviously was going to have to be dealt with. And they knew it because they had, they knew it was wrong. They just decided to postpone that. And that's what they ultimately did. But the bottom line is they came up with a document that created a system of government that was based on the Hebrew Republic. And, you know, you thought, well, I never heard this. <clears throat> it's interesting because uh, I was teaching a course in the Constitution at another Christian college in, in uh, Charlotte. And instead of using the E.C. Wines book, I actually used a brand new book from Harvard University that taught the exact same thing. Because historically, it's accurate. And so this is not something that is just uh, unusual. You've just probably never been taught this. And this is one of the things about getting a doctorate from a Christian university, which you are doing. You should be exposed to the Christian side of things. Maybe learn a few things that you've never heard before because they matter. They're important. And just because you never heard it, just because it's not fashionable, doesn't mean it isn't true. So I know we spent a long, a long time talking about the theistic basis of the founding of this country. But later on, we have significant influences from the secular side. Secular humanism also has tremendous uh, influence on American politics currently. So let's go back and let's review. Under the secular system, there is no God. So government exists to maximize the benefits of mankind as a whole. So remember the perspective in the secular humanist uh, worldview is humanity. It is not the individual. Under the theistic system, it's one man, one vote. Every person is equal. Every person has the same influence on selection of, of leadership and, and policy. But not so in the secular system. The, the perspective is not what's good for the individual. The perspective is what's good for mankind, what's good for the whole. Secondly, rights are bestowed by government. If you take God out of the picture, remember it was John Locke who wrote about natural rights and how God bestows upon people their individual importance and rights and the things that that because they are God's creations, they have the right to do. Well, there, is, there aren't no God-given rights in the secular perspective on government. What rights people have are bestowed by government. And if government, what they give, they are free to take away. For example, uh, in our Constitution, there's nothing that gives government the right to tell you that you have to wear a mask when you're in public. It's just not there. It's there. There's no health care aspect in the Constitution. Sorry. But for the good of humanity, government must take away that right for the individual to decide what they what they wear in public. So what the government gives, the government can take away. 
The third thing to remember about secular government is that there is no egalitarianism in government. Under the theistic perspective, all men are endowed by their creator with equal rights. And because they are made in God's image, we have to respect the competence, the value, the intellect of the individual. So there's no such thing. As a matter of fact, it's exactly the opposite in the secular humanist perspective of government. People are not equal. Some are more equal than others. And those are the people that should be making the decision for everybody else. So it's a patently elitist system where individual liberties are subservient to collective goods. And those who make the decisions for humanity should be the best and the brightest. So there's, there's the theistic perspective of the founding fathers was very egalitarian. People are equal, not necessarily in ability, but in value. And because of everyone's creation in the image of God, they have, you have to respect that. You have to let them decide for themselves how to pursue their own happiness. But not so in the new uh, secular humanist perspective. It's what's good for humanity is all that matters. Let's continue our discussion of secular humanist principles. Decision making should be based on fact and science, not mystic re revelations. In the theistic perspective, we show great respect towards the revelations in Scripture. Under the secular humanist perspective, we should use science and scientific methodology to discern what is true. So, undoubtedly, you have heard recently as we discuss this COVID-19 virus, uh, follow the science, follow the science. The decision-making should be based on science, not what people want to do for themselves. So that's one of the basic principles of secular humanist uh, governance is follow the science. <clears throat> Next. The obligation of the most fortunate to provide and guide societies less fortunate. When I was a young political science prof, just got out of grad school, my first teaching job was at Eastern Kentucky University. Good school, big school. And I participated in a panel discussion with one of the senior uh, political scientists on the faculty a woman from uh, Connecticut, I think, who was from quite a wealthy family. And she told a story in this discussion about how she had had all the advantages. She got to go to the best schools. She got the best education. She had all the advantages. So it was her obligation to make decisions for those who had not had those advantages. It was the most elitist thing I'd ever heard. Remember, I'm still just a uh, fresh, fresh out of Christian university. And of course, I went to the University of Kentucky Graduate School, so that had a profound impact, impact on me, but I'm still the same person. I see everyone as of equal value and with such individual competence that they can decide for themselves. I don't need some best educated person to make decisions for me. <clears throat> so I'm still an egalitarian. I'm not the elitist that this uh, was being presented to me. I don't think 
that the less fortunate needs the best and the brightest and those with the best educations to make the decisions for them. The final aspect of secular humanist uh, governance is that an individual's value is a function of their contribution to the collective. The old have an obligation to just go ahead and die. That was a quote from Richard Lamb, who was governor of Colorado a while back, when talking about the fact that the average American citizen will spend something like 80 to 90 percent of their lifetime expenses on health care in the last six months of their life. In other words, you can expect when you get old that that's when you're going to really accumulate a lot of health care expenses. His comment was, the old just need to go ahead and die and quit racking up all these huge bills for medical care. The need of the collective for health care resources exceeds the need of the individual to survive a little longer. That is totally in keeping with the uh, secular humanist ideology that your, your value as an individual is tied to your contribution to the collective. So this notion that the old just need to go ahead and die. Now is, I'm no longer a spring chicken. I'm in my 60s now. And this notion that I just need to die and get out of the way and save health care resources for the young who are producing, uh, that, that, that attitude is becoming a little bit more threatening to me at this point. Now we're getting into the meat of this course, the theistic economic system. It is not by accident that writers like John Locke, who had such a profound influence on not only uh, British intellectual thinking, but also American political and philosophical thinking, that the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776. And it talked about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Coincidentally, and really not coincidentally, the single greatest work of economics ever written was also written in 1776. It was a book called Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. And it outlined an economic system that was based on the individual's decision-making. It believed that individual consumers were smart enough to decide how to maximize their own economic utility. And that if you allowed freedom to reign, if you allowed the basic economic questions, which is what are we going to produce, how are we going to produce it, and who's going to get it? If we allow those three basic economic questions to be answered by demand, what is it people want to buy? If you do that, it will create a system that will promote the most efficient distribution of resources and allow for the greatest prosperity. So. Wealth of Nations was based upon the notion of freedom. That what is made ought to be what people want to consume. It has a respect for the individual consumer and lets the individual consumer guide the market. To reiterate, Adam Smith believed that consumer demand should answer those three basic economic questions. What will be made, how will it be made, and who will get it? Here's the fundamental point of this economic model. What people want is more important than what people need. People get to decide for themselves what they want. 
there is always going to be inherent waste in this model because sometimes people want the wrong things. One of my favorite examples, I'm a car guy. I think I've mentioned in previous discussions here that I restore cars. So I love, I love cars. And right now, uh, if, if you look at the car market, there's a car called a, a Hellcat. Dodge Charger Hellcat. It's something like 800 horsepower in a street car that anybody can go and buy. Now the issue is, does anybody need a Hellcat? Obviously, no. Nobody needs a Hellcat. So why are we making Hellcats in this country? It's because people want those cars. The issue is not what they need. I mean, if you allowed people to, to use the criteria of what do we need, we'd all be driving smart cars or Priuses or something like that. There would be no Hellcats. So the principle uh, of the free market is that it is consumer demand that determines what it is that's going to be actually built. So to reiterate, Wealth of Nations, 1776, it believed that the individual is competent and capable of maximizing their own utility. In other words, the individual knows what they want and what would make their life the most improved. Secondly, the market must be free to respond to the demand inputs of the free consumers. So the market, when it receives guidance from the consumers, in other words, suddenly there's a demand for a certain item, it must be free to move resources into the production of whatever it is that the demand desires. The market must be free to create Hellcats if once it perceives that there is a market for 800 horsepower streetcars. Thirdly, it is only the demands of the consumers would answer those basic economic questions. It is not the input from the wise. It is not about what we need. It is what we want. Because that allows something called, Adam Smith called the invisible hand to guide the economy into maximum prosperity. So if you just let freedom prevail and you base your economic system on demand, and not what people need, then as if by some invisible hand, the economy will be guided into the maximum level of prosperity. So that's a theistic economic system. You may have heard of it. It's called free market capitalism. So let's jump to the other side, the secular economic system. Notable philosophers or economists in this realm are guys like Karl Marx, you may have heard of him, he's quite famous, or John Maynard Keynes, another British uh, philosopher, economist. They believed that the three basic economic questions should be answered not by individual demand, but by central planning. It's not about <clears throat> what's going to make the individual's life the most improved or the happiest? That's not the issue. The issue is there are finite economic resources and those need to be distributed with some thought and some planning. So it's not freedom, it's control that is the basis of secular economic planning. So who needs to decide the answers to those basic economic questions? What's going to be built? How's it going to be built? And who's going to get it? 
Well, rather than it be demand and the price system that allows people to pay for what they want, it needs to be the best and the brightest deciding what limited economic resources, how those can be used for the maximum benefit of humanity. So it's not about demand. It's about the supply and how to determine what is supplied, not by individual demand, but by the dictates of the best and the brightest who keep in mind the, the needs of humanity, not the desires of the individual. Marx and Keynes continued, their strategy is to see economic resources concentrated into the hands of the elites or government. Thereby, they have the ability to reward desired industries, to uh, subsidize things that they believe are important for the common man or whatever. So if you look at Keynesian economic policy, the goal is priming the pump, starting from the top and injecting funds into the economy to create prosperity. That's why they believe in taxes on the wealthy. The accumulated wealth of rich people is better served in the hands of government where their elites can make decisions about where that money should be spent. If you leave it in the hands of rich people, they may want yachts and Learjets. And that's very beneficial for them, but not for the whole mass of people. So the whole goal of the collectivist economic systems is to accumulate wealth into the hands of those who are the best and the brightest who can make the decisions for society at large. We see this happening in this presidential election we just got through, that one side wants to cut taxes and leave people with their own money in their own hands. The other wants to raise taxes in order to accumulate more money into the hands of the government so that it can make the economic decisions about what is made, how it's made, who's going to get it. So you see stark examples in, in just this presidential election of the theistic and the secular economic systems. But the most important thing to remember is that in the secular economic system, nobody cares what you want. It's their job to figure out what you need. And to make sure that everybody has what they need and we don't have inefficient use of resources by building Hellcats or whatever else, Learjets. Or, matter of fact, a few years ago, they put a huge tax on yachts uh, because they thought it was a waste of resources. So if you're going to spend money on a yacht, you're going to have to pay a huge tax because they want to discourage consumption like that. All it did was threw a lot of blue collar workers out of work and er the rich people just went overseas and bought foreign yachts. So sometimes the elitist attitude of they know what's best uh, is pretty short sighted. And in this Soul book that you're going to be reading, Thomas Soul, he talks about thinking beyond stage one. Because a lot of times economic decisions are made uh, with the best of intentions, but yet they have no idea what the ultimate consequences are going to be later on. So that's the difference between uh, secular and theistic economic systems. To reiterate, 
This course also deals with public policy. By definition, simply put, public policy is anything which government chooses to do or not to do. So it's a very broad topic. Sometimes public policy is doing nothing. Other times public policy is um, coming up with a regulation or a law or something that government chooses to do. So now we have a working definition of public policy. It's anything government chooses to do or not to do. This, this is pretty obvious here, these uh, distinctions. But when you think about theistic public policy, recall that the theistic perspective has great respect for the competence and ability of the individual. They're equally valuable and equal, equally capable of making decisions for their own lives. They don't need somebody taking care of them. Therefore, in general, the theistic perspective is to have public policy that is oriented towards the free market. This is something you have seen in the Trump administration. The Trump administration cut regulations, cut taxes, and let people decide for themselves how they wanted to live their lives or how they wanted to spend their money. In general, public policy from a theistic perspective emphasizes the free market, the private sector solutions to problems. I mean, let's face it, there are problems. Which tool do you choose to solve those problems? Traditional, shall we say conservatism, prefers the tool of the private sector because it fits with the overall perspective of respect for the competence and ability and decision-making uh, of the individual. So individual solutions from a theistic perspective. Secular public policy has exactly the opposite perspective. It believes in collective solutions. It believes in collective institutions as the tools to solve problems. Poverty, you know, on the theistic side, it's get somebody a job. On the secular side, it's let's take money from the wealthy and redistribute it to poor people. That's a collective solution to a commonly, ex we agree to, that there's a problem. But instead of a private sector solution, like get somebody a job, it's take money from those that have it and give it to those that don't. It is a collective solution using the tools of government or big institutions to solve the same problems. So that's the point of this secular versus theistic public policy is one prefers private sector solutions, individual solutions. The other prefers public sector solutions and collective solutions. So as you study the Thomas Sowell book, and as you're learning more about the nuts and bolts of, of economics, just keep these simplistic models alive because you'll you'll start to see that proposals are coming from either the theistic or the secular orientation. And this will help you greatly understand what you're looking at and the motivation behind certain uh, public policy suggestions. So just keep that in mind. Uh, you are training to become administrators of mental health services programs. And as such, you are going to have the opportunity to tap into private sector solutions or public sector solutions. Just realize that both can be valuable and, and effective. So keep that in mind as your economic knowledge grows during the course of this first half of this of the uh,
course. And then remember, you're going to be doing a policy brief. You're going to get into the policy sciences in the last four weeks of this module. During that time, keep in mind the distinctions between public sector versus private sector policy solutions. There can be either one. And you may choose to uh, study a policy problem from the private sector or from the public sector and use the same tools of research to make wise decisions based upon the best available data. Thank you for paying attention and I appreciate your time and I hope that these simplistic models that I've outlined for you will prove value, valuable not only during this course but during your career as well. Thank you.